Buonasera e benvenuti a questo nuovo appuntamento di PDE Social Club. Eh, questa sera si parla di scienza. Eh, a proposito di un libro appena pubblicato da Delphi, eh, quando abbiamo smesso di capire il mondo dello scrittore eh, cileno ma nato in Olanda, Benjamin Labattut, che sarà intervistato dalla scrittrice Claudia Durastanti. Si parla di scienza in un libro che non è un saggio, non è un romanzo, è un romanzo che è anche un saggio è un saggio che però ha una tenuta narrativa molto particolare ma di tutto questo ci raccontano Claudia Durastanti e Benjamin Labatut buona serata ciao a tutte, ciao a tutti che ci state seguendo hi Benjamin, oggi siamo qui per uh, parlare di questo libro quando abbiamo smesso di capire il mondo che è un'avventura oserei dire Uh, tra la saggistica e il romanzo sulle vite di scienziati professionisti tendenzialmente ma anche scienziati forse per caso in circostanze misteriose e imperscrutabili che uh, nella prima metà del novecento ma anche dopo insomma, c'è un ampio spazio corposo dedicato uh, agli esordi del secolo e in particolare alle due guerre mondiali e che impatto hanno avuto poi sul uh, indirizzare in qualche modo delle scoperte che hanno alterato il corso della storia dell'umanità. Dico tra romanzo e saggio, non mi voglio incacciare nei guai uh, andando sulle sottigliezze di queste commissioni perché poi uh, ne parleremo con uh, l'autore e è interessante notare come la scienza venga presentata Uh, in sé come un composto chimico instabile fatto di elementi puri uh, e spuri e ci sia anche questo tentativo un po' di reinventare il discorso su come si racconta la scienza e come si ritira il linguaggio scientifico rispetto a un linguaggio lirico o in che modo le due forme si corrompono o seducono a, a vicenda. E si spazia poi, c'è anche di Sebaldiano, anche lì uh, un tentativo di andare a indagare quasi nelle botteghe degli scienziati e ci sono immagini abbastanza, ci sono colori assassini in questo libro, ci sono dei veleni che sanno di frutta e poi è caratterizzato da una struttura particolarissima uh, di cui poi andrò a illustrare un po' i, i meriti e anche la componente di, di innovazione. So, my first question is, uh, we live in a kind of framework right now where what science and non-science are presented in a sort of dichotomy where science kind of is presented as pure in a way, or lightning. And of course, there's an understanding of the spurious element, but there is a privileged dimension of telling science in a certain way, you know, privileging, you know, the kind of linear storytelling in order to counter bad science or false information. What I really liked about your book, and I thought it was super fascinating, especially in the first part, which is kind of a quasi nonfiction essay, but I don't want to delve too much into labels. Uh, what I found intriguing is the fact that you present science and non-science, all the collateral forces and the principal forces in a sort of flow where everything is interdependent in a way. So history, politics, different cultural ecologies, and also the history of art. So I wanted to know how do you feel about this interaction between singular forces and collective forces and how you understand this flow? Well, that, that particular text and, and, and the book as a whole is, is, is a bit like a, like a spider's web. It's trying to connect many things. Um, if you look at that web in the morning when it's just covered in dew and the sun's rays are glinting off it, you'll, you'll find it very beautiful. It's going to seem like um, something incredible. But if you run into it at night, you can sort of catch a glimpse of the spider that's sitting there in the middle, you know, sort of waiting for you. Uh, and I, I think that both in science and in our, in our own lives, things are this, they work this way. There's, they're an entangled web, you know, and we can really, uh, we can never understand the nature of phenomena unless we understand them in their interdependence. Uh, the complexity that arises from even the simplest interactions right, can be really breathtaking. So, and we have to live with this. But the truth is that we, as human beings, as as scientists, as writers, we we cannot really 
interact with that web, you know, because we have to live with purpose and, and meaning. So what we do is we, we cut through this complexity with fiction, with stories. It's not just uh, literature that tells stories. Science is, a, is a, also a web of stories and it, it gives shape to the world, but that, that shape is not a mirror of the, of the shape of things. It's really, it's more a reflection of our, the shape of our own minds. You know? so, so this intertwined set of stories, I, I, in that particular text that opens the books, uh, I just started pulling on a thread and, uh, and I got there via a roundabout where I started, I learned that cyanide coats the Halley's Comet, the crust of the comet, and that cyanide was also a, one of the possible precursors for RNA and, and DNA, you know, organochemical compounds. And I simply followed that thread. You know? the, the funny thing about it is that because of this interconnected nature, if you look closely at, at any one phenomena, you can, you can sort of get a glimpse of the way things really work. And that glimpse tends to be rather, rather terrifying because, because you become aware that just to step out of the door, just to take the slightest step requires enormous courage. If you're, if you're consciously aware of the chain of events that you might set in motion. And um, I, I really, it was, it, it was a wandering, it was a wandering text that had a singular point, which was cyanide. And I just followed it through as I did during the rest of the book, just intuition. There was no pre-planned uh, image of the whole book. It arose as I went along. You're kind of anticipating my second question, but I'll go ahead uh, anyway. So the first story I forgot to mention is called Blue di Prussia in Italian. And it has this kind of uh, very nautical flow in terms of prose and I read it a couple of times and I know this word is very abused but there's also I think a formal idea of transmission and contagion you know between the, the parts um, speaking of, of which I wanted to ask you uh, the book is clearly obsessed with the idea of invention or epiphanies in science or discovery and technology or human progress but at the same time it feels to me that you were kind of drawn to the notion of invention in fiction itself. The structure of the book, it, it is very peculiar. You, so you start with this almost uh, entirely nonfiction story, and then you have two short stories, then you have a novella, then you have a kind of final wrap up, The Night Gardener, where all the particles uh, that you left over or kind of floating around writing in the first parts kind of all condensed. That's how I felt it in the same final space. So I want to, and, and to me, invention is not only the subject of the book, but it's also in a way the formal principle that brings, that helps the book together. So I wanted to know your take on this, how much you were caring for invention in science and fiction at the same time. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm personally obsessed with, with epiphany and uh, uh, I've sort of chased after that experience my whole life. and and. I don't really think you can do anything new if you know exactly what you're doing. So uh, the truth is I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't set down to write a strange book. I knew the ideas that, that haunt the book because they are ideas that haunt me. You know? And they have to do with knowability. What can we understand about the world? What can we understand about ourselves? And the book did come out from a period of, 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 of strangeness, of estrangement, which I sort of forci forcibly put myself through. You know? And uh, I didn't sit down and said, okay, this is the shape that this particular text will take. Uh, I do think that the scientists that I write about uh, and the mechanism of epiphany has to do with a certain um, becoming permeable to the world. You open yourself up. And that process is, is, is very dangerous psychologically, you know, because you're trying to get something bigger than yourself to, to come through. And I know it's, it's, rather, it's, a, it's a rather trite image because science does not progress that way. Science is a team effort. It's slow. 
It doesn't rely on sudden discoveries, but that is not what fascinates me. You know? I'm interested in, in singularities. I'm interested in this, in the moment where a sort of otherworldly knowledge pushes through. Yeah. And, in, you know, and the way that it comes through is through people's minds, men and women who, who sort of open themselves up to something that is larger than themselves. You know? Perhaps it's their own unconscious, but I do feel that we are all constantly battling. You know? We all have this, this sort of suspicion that this wonderful castle of reason that we have built all around us is, is, is surrounded on, on all sides and that the walls can be easily breached, you know? not, 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 not just from the outside, but also from, from within. It doesn't matter how high we build them. If you are fascinated by the world, the world will infect you with a part of itself. And it is very, it is, um, it's transformative, but it is also very dangerous, not just for the subject who experiences, who sees the new, no? You have to be aware that knowledge, self-knowledge as well comes a, at a price. There's a price to pay. And the book uh, is sort of uh, trying to get people to be aware because I think we're going through a period of like of massive change right now. It's not the only, it's not the first time, it's not the last time that has happened, no. But there's an order around us that is just begging to die and we're putting it down. And I think the, the book sort of is obsessed with that. How do these ideas come into the world and what is the price we pay for them? Yeah, if you can focus a bit on this idea of singularity, which is another subject inside the book, which is potentially destroying, you know, the entire space. Uh, so I wanted to know in terms of the history of ideas, of course, the idea we had of what a genius is, you know, and every, even in rhetorical terms of madness and darkness, how did it change for you over time? And what kind of value or where do you locate it right now? Because there are terrible forces within the idea of a singular genius, of course, which happens and you read it in the book. Some of them are conspirators, sometimes feel, some of them feel almost like terrorists against themselves. So you partially answered before, but I really wanted to know in the tradition of ideas and romantic idea of a genius, how this evolved over time in your practice. And this has, you know, uh, consequences also in how you think about uh, the author or like, you know, geniuses in literature itself. Mm. Well, I know, again, I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed by my fixation on geniuses. No, it's something I've felt my entire life. I would suddenly, I would have, a, I had a classmate who was incredibly talented, just physically talented. And I, I used to look at him and I, I couldn't understand the way he did things. And the funny thing, what draw me to this idea of genius is that he didn't understand either. You no, know? the way he played football, the way he moved, the way he used his body was unconscious. It was God given. And I understand that we, um, I do believe that the, these singularities um, surround us. It, it, in literature, you can see it all the time. Somebody like Roberto Bolaño comes along and you can say, well, it, you, 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 there's really no explanation for it. And, 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 and then all this literature tries to analyze the phenomena. No? How did this come about? We don't have a good explanation for it. No? And in the book, I'm, uh, it's not just the figure of the, the, of the genius because geniuses tend to be very common. We are very, we're all very common. That's, Part of what makes us so wonderful, no? We're, we're common, we share our weaknesses, no? But then, then, then there's these tiny moments that even, that even people of genius do not comprehend, no? In the case of, of, of uh, Werner Heisenberg, when he came up with the first, uh, first version of quantum mechanics, the people around him would look at the equations set down on paper. And it's not that they don't understand the equations, it's that they don't understand the leaps of logic that he took. And by his own admission, he did not understand them either. They don't really make formal sense. So 
what I'm just trying to point at is that we carry around this sort of massive shadow that is living through us and that we are not uh, responsible for everything that we do. We're not even responsible for our own moments of, of, of extreme enlightenment, no. We are lived by the world. We are lived by other forces as well. It's not just reason, no. So I, I, I study, like I say, no, like if, if, the, if science studies the speed of light, I think literature is obsessed with, with the speed of, of shadow, how this, this shadow comes through us, no? And uh, because the light of reason is so, also something that, 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 that can blind us. But, and there's a lot that we can see once we sort of open ourselves up, close our eyes, no? And let the world speak through us. And that's something that everybody who's written a single page of text knows. It is a strange state that you have to conjure up. And then comes work, no? You sit down and you use the sort of the front part of your brain to figure out what this other part of your brain is saying. That brings up the issue of language, I guess, also. And so uh, every time writers or cultural mediators try to translate you know, the realm of science into you know, common speak, I guess, or even literature, uh, there is almost this spontaneous reliance on poetry, on some closeness between the abstractness of mathematics and lyrical verses. And so it's very easily to, to fall in this kind of equation, I'd say. And, uh, but as much as it common sense and stereotypes hold <laughs> truth in a way in bringing different experiences together. So in terms of style, I was wondering what was the approach to uh, kind of use language in a beautiful way? You know, your prose is very reactive. It's almost like a chemical compound. It felt to me that was very quick and reacting to the notions or concepts that were being played out. So I wondered if you ever were worried about risking it in a way and making it sound too abstract or lyrical or kind of uh, fallen into that slip where science, you know, at the highest peak has its own mystique and it becomes very obscure. Well, yes. I mean, I think the world is very obscure. You no, know? our minds are very obscure and words, words are, 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 are a terrible problem. You no, know? I, I don't think we use them all the time, completely unaware of the fact that they cover as much as, as they show. They're very problematic and, and, and language, language has been several times in my life a, 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 a real problem. You can lose your faith in language's capacity to speak about the world, no? And if you don't have other languages, like for example, the language of mathematics, you have to rely inevitably on words, on, on images, poetic images, you no? Know? But they are a very sorry substitute for, for direct perception, you no? Know? And I think they're also very far apart from, from, from pure thought. And they don't, and, and they, don't all, and they don't translate to mathematical knowledge or to scientific images, you no? Know, which has its, its own beauty. So I've always been, and ever more so interest in what words cannot express. Uh, that is why singularities, the void, are things that, that fascinates me, you know? You inevitably fall into poetry, but, but, but I do it, I think you can tell in the book that I do it very unwillingly because, mm -hmm. because I think that truth, deep truth, is something that, that you behold and that as soon as you open your mouth or you put pen to paper, uh, you're betraying yourself and you're also betraying the experience that, that you're trying to transmit. And I think that writers are very keenly aware of it, um, um, but, but we persist because we don't really have a choice and we're very stubborn, you no? Know? But if, if, if we could, if, if a writer could trap God inside of a book, he would do it, you know, uh, like the Christian things they've done with, with the Bible. Uh, when you say if I was 
afraid of 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 of, of falling into into poetry i'd say yes but in another sense in, in the sense that i have had my own experiences which do not which cannot be properly translated into into words and when that happens if you have any such experience you have you have you fall into a, a, a communication problem when something very important has happened to you but you can't express it you know so it's not that i've been damaged by language or or burnt to a crisp no but i have been slightly scalded by it you no know? and and that is why i'm also drawn to these particular stories because it's it's a personal obsession for me it's not just an an intellectual one i am constantly trying to speak of something that resists language through these stories which are if you read them they're all sort of pointing to to several abysses you know the abyss of the gas chambers the abyss that's inside matter you know the abyss at the center of a black hole those singular experiences that point past our understanding uh and that we uh sort of tread towards uh and we're almost dumbstruck when we get too close yeah i've always managed to consider language as a black market but i can tell to you it's like a black hole and the book has an increasing rate of fictionality in it and so when you come to an existing uh, mathematician who's i'm gonna spell this terribly wrong is Sinichi mochizuki uh when i read it about him the first time i thought oh my god this is too good to be true. He, it looks like he's out of a Delilah novel, you know? <laughs> and so I wanted to know what was your approach to the, um, this compound of reality and imagination, which I think pertains to any human being and how you tell your, yourself and the stories about yourself, but how it was for you as a tool, you know, as a writer to work with this different degree of nonfiction and fiction when it came to specific identities in the book. Mm. Well, in the case of Shinichi Mochizuki, he is a working mathematician, yeah. uh, but he had no, but I, what I did is, but, but it's a, and I'd like to be very clear about this, the entire book is a work of fiction. It is a fictional construct. It is a, it has a sort of a taste of reality because of the sources that I use, but it is a fictional construct, nonetheless, you know. And in the case of Chinichi Mochizuki, he's a working mathematician. He's very talented. He, but he and he published these proofs. But then I, I just fictionalize. You no, know? it's not the real person. He never met the other uh, character in the story. You no, know? I was drawn to his story because of, of again unknowability. These wonderful stories about how the proof that he had published seemed to be. To fall into that particular category that I am so attracted to, which is we can't tell if it's true or not. We can't really understand it. And I took that and I started studying him, and he was very fascinating. But then I, I just added, uh, and then I, I bumped into a, a larger figure, which is Alexander Grodenbeek. And uh, the funny thing about that is that his story, which is absolutely unbelievable, is is true for the for 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 the most part you know um about the relationship between fiction and reality i have to say that i am very cavalier about it because i'm doing fiction i'm very aware that i'm writing fiction uh, but i am also if i could my first drafts are 100% non fiction i am i i become fascinated by ideas i i i am my friends and the people who read my first drafts they're like you're a writer you have to make things up please just you no know, make things up and i resist it you no know? and i'm like this should be enough reality is fascinating enough but then i give in because they're right they are absolutely right you no know? reality isn't enough that's why we that's why we've created fiction uh we really are are completely unaware of how the power that fiction has over us i'm not just speaking about literary fiction you no know? and uh the sort of recipe that i use is that i try to 
get as far as I can with reality and then fiction lets you go that extra step because only fiction can take that step. You really can't get there. Uh, reality um, does not like to undress, no? She's very shy, no? she will resist whatever. And, and we see this all around us now where people are trying to sort of get back to reality. No, they're trying desperately to sort of get back to a world that is that is understandable, that is comprehensible. And, uh, and to me, it's like, well, it's never been comprehensible. You just had a simplified view of the world. No? So one of the things that this book uh, has taught me, and one of the reasons why I'm fascinated by quantum mechanics is that it sort of forces you to have multiple viewpoints about the world. It, it forces you to have different perspectives, no? And uh, I take that idea, and I think it's, it's something that we should all incorporate. We should have, we should have, uh, we should also all delve into the irrational. We should have opposing worldviews, not just uh, physics and mathematics, but also the, the I Ching and Tarot. We need to have these viewpoints that sort of overlap because every single viewpoint has blind spots and some viewpoints like the materialistic scientific viewpoint which is something that I am all for has massive blind spots huge blind spots I sort of write about those blind spots you know so if you have several different opposing views of reality they overlap and they give you a larger picture and uh, I think that one of the things I've, I've, uh, when you speak, when, when I hear you speak about Chinichi Mochisugi, I do become aware that reality can be very easily replaced by fiction. And I'm not sure about how I feel about that. So, uh, and I'm, <laughs> one of my friends was joking, if they ever make a, a, a movie about your books, the movie will replace your book because images are stronger than words. So I think it's, it's just a fine line and we're all trying to tread it, no? We can, we can fall on either side. But if everybody would be slightly more aware of how much fiction there is, even in perception, we're making guesses. We're not seeing the world, no? We're making constant guesses about it. I just try to write in that, that fault line between what's real and what's not real. Yeah, I, I don't know. I wonder if it's replacing or it's, you know, parallel universes. There's a coexistence of uh, languages in which you try to tell a story. So I was looking up the reviews uh, of the book and I read kind of everything, you know, and its weirdness. It's being a nonfiction novel. And, and to me, rather than the method, you know, when you have to classify writing like this, it, it has to do a lot with temperature and the drive you have and to me the drive is clearly novelistic you know and its whole purposes uh even if it's a very peculiar machine that has different parts um being a translator i couldn't help but notice the fact that this book is translated in italian by lisa topi that the original title and i'm gonna mispronounce this too un verdor terrible uh and so yeah. okay and whether in, in English it's when we cease to understand the world and I noticed that there is an extra passage in Italian because cease uh, is not said in the past in Italian it's quando abbiamo smesso di capire il mondo so it identifies kind of a back step where we stopped doing that uh, but coming to the, the opposition in a way and this is also the title of a novella in the book of course um, I wanted to know whether you agree with the fact that the original kind of builds up on this uh, green plague or toxicity and it has an element of opacity and absurdity and obscurity as well uh, and the contrast with the moral, I don't know if you like this word, transparency of the question of when we see, you know, to understand the world. So to me, this kind of interplay between two different forces, you know, opacity and transparency has something to do with the book and I wanted to know what you feel about it. Well, the English title is a bit on the nose because that is the, the, the theme of the book is sort of laid out in the title, no? It is about, the book is really, if you had to boil it down, it's about that. 
It's about the limits of thought, the limits of rationality. And it also, it also harks back to the, the, the historical period that I'm writing about, you know, which is sort of the 1920s, when science became aware of its limitations and we, when we understood just how strange, not just the world of, of spirit was, no, but the world of matter is, and, 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 it, and how it was stranger than we had ever imagined. In, but I, I am, the book has many titles in other languages as well. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. In, in, in German, it's called The Blind Light. And it, it also has a lot to do with, with, with what the book is about. The idea that, that reason can also blind us, you know, that it's not just, uh, there is a particular darkness that comes along with thinking. And um, in Spanish, Un Verdor Terrible, is the last line of the first text of Prussian Blue. And um, it sort of marked a turning point for me because the, that text, which is an essay, was 100% nonfiction. And it ended with a scene, which I thought was wonderful and terrible, uh, of an elephant who was killed uh, during the, the wars that Edison the wars, the electricity wars. Electricity wars yeah. yeah. So there were two different standards of electricity, and just to, and somebody wanted to show that that the standard that we now use was very dangerous. So they hooked up this elephant, who had been condemned to death because he, they had set him loose inside a police station. It's a wonderful story, and uh, they in um, in Coney Island, and and then they they electrocuted him, and they also fed fed him a massive dose of cyanide. So the, the, it ended with the, with the death of this massive elephant from cyanide. And that was the way that it tied in with the rest of the text. But it didn't work because there was a, a central mystery, a moral mystery in that text, which has to do with Fritz Haber, the inventor of a, the man who fixed nitrogen from the air, the man who, who began gas warfare. And I didn't have a proper ending and I just said, well, I, I made up this, list, this letter I, and I inserted a tiny sliver of fiction into the nonfiction text and it changed completely. And that's what fiction does. It's an added ingredient. It's something that is not a part of the world and that somehow corresponds to the world in a way that regular nonfiction doesn't know. That was for me, so the moment where the, the entire book started mutating into something different. And it also gave me an, an enormous amount of freedom. And so in another sense, the, 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 the different titles also speak to the, to the central idea that I've spoken about in the interview, which is the need for, for different perspectives. We need to look at the world with several sets of eyes, no? So you have the image of, of a terrible greening, of a terrible, of a, of a, of a non-human future that is awaiting, just, that is sort of just waiting for us to get out of the way before nature comes back with a vengeance, you know? And, uh, and it's also the, the idea that, that, uh, that nature has a harshness and a cruelty to it that comes through us, but that it's not, it's not just limited to mankind. There's also a madness to the world. And in the, in the, in the Italian and the English title is, as I said, it, it touches the heart of the book, no? When we stopped understanding ourselves, when we stopped understanding the world. And, uh, and the blind light in German and in Dutch has to do with this, with this idea, no? That there is, that there is, uh, that there is a very dangerous element to knowing ever more about the world. Every time we uncover something, there's always something hidden beneath the rock as well that comes to light. So I'm, I'm happy that it has several titles. Yeah, and so I think we can wrap it up here with the corruption and also open up spaces and freedom that you have in fiction as much as you have it in progress and you know technological progress and thanks for <laughs> enlightening a bit of the book uh, grazie a chi ci ha seguito direi che 
un modo forse per racchiudere il senso del libro è che Fritz Heber, che citava Nobel in chimica, ha in qualche modo ha aperto nuovi spazi di ecologia, ha inventato i fertilizzanti, ha permesso all'umanità di prosperare, però ha anche inventato delle armi di sterminio di massa, basandosi sullo stesso principio, uh, e quindi qualcosa che dà la vita, in qualche modo la, la rende anche tossica, e nel breve racconto finale, che si chiama Il giardiniere di notte, si discute un po' questo tema della, della natura che riprende il sopravvento, ma da un, di una natura che è anche fondamentalmente maligna. E grazie a tutti per averci seguito. Bye. Bye. Grazie allora a Benjamin Labatut, grazie a Claudia Durastanti, grazie a tutti voi e ci troviamo per la prossima puntata di PDE Social Club. A presto.